This is part 5 in our series of lectures on section 5.1 um, dealing with equivalent sets. And in this lecture we're going to look at a few general results concerning equivalence of sets. By general I mean that the results will deal with completely generic sets and won't make any assumption about those sets being finite or infinite. So let's start with four sets and we'll, we'll make the assumption that A is has the same cardinality as C, and B has the same cardinality as D. So from these sets we can create new sets, and so the question is, what kinds of sets can we create from these sets um, in such a way that the new sets we get will also have the same cardinalities? For example, we can create these Cartesian products A cross B and C cross D. If we know that A and C have the same cardinality, and B and D have the same cardinality, do you think that we can say that these sets have the same cardinality? Well, since we have a bijection from this set to this set, and we have a bijection from this set to this set, and since when you take Cartesian products, the coordinates, the, or the components of the Cartesian product behave fairly independently of each other, I would conjecture that, in fact, these two sets really are um, related. They really are equivalent to each other in the sense of cardinality. Another kind of set we can create from these sets is we can take the union of A with B and the union of C with D. Um, if A and C have the same cardinality and B and D have the same cardinality, can we expect the union, the unions to have the same cardinality? Well, not really, because, you see, when you take a union, if A and B have a lot of overlap between them, when you take the union, you don't really get much more than you started with, uh, whereas if C and D have no overlap between each other, you, get, you can get something much bigger. And so you can't really anticipate, at least in the case of finite sets, you can't say in general that these would be equivalent to each other. But if A and B have no elements in common, and C and D have no elements in common, then we probably should be willing to believe that they, the, the new unions, the unions will have the same cardinality. So that's a conjecture that we make. So we've got two conjectures here, this one and this one, and um, we'll just simply try to prove those on the next slide. So we're going to state it as a theorem. We give ourselves four sets. We suppose that A is, has the same cardinality as C, B has the same cardinality as D. Then, in general, A cross B and C cross D will have the same cardinality. And if A and B are disjoint and C and D are disjoint, then the union will have the same cardinalities. The unions will have the same cardinalities. So let me start the proof for you. By assumption, this assumption says that there exists a bijection f from A to C, and this assumption here says that there exists a bijection g from B to D. So the idea of the proof is we have to use f and g to create bijections here and here. So here I've started, started you out in the right direction. I say, let's define H from A cross B to C cross D. I'm trying to prove this one. And so the question is, what do you think would work? We know that we can map A to C bijectively via F. We can map B to D bijectively via G. How could we somehow use those to create a function that maps a Cartesian product to a Cartesian product? You start with an element X, Y in here. Where do you think you should map it using this f and this g? Well, the most natural way to go is to take the x component and use f of x on it, take the y component and use g of y on it, and then just create an ordered pair out of it so as to give you an, yourself an element of c cross d. It's then not a very difficult exercise to prove that this function is in fact a bijection. And I'm going to leave that for you to do as an exercise. So that completes the proof of uh, part one. Now let's look at part two. We have to see if we can create a bijection from this set into this set using the f and the g. 
So how should we define this function h from a union b into c union d by making use of f and g? Think about that for a moment and uh, I'll show you what I wrote in, in a few seconds. Well, what we do is, if x happens to be in A, you see, we take an x in here, it's in the union, and therefore either it's in A or it's in B. It can't be in both because of our, our assumption that A and B are disjoint. If it happens to be in A, take f of it. If it happens to be in B, take g of it. Either way, we're going to get an element of C union D when we do this. So that's a very natural choice for our function h, and then it's just a matter of showing that it's really a bijection. So I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you, but we can talk a little bit about the idea of the proof. How would you prove that it's injective? Well, injective means you have to give yourself two x values in the union, and you're going to assume that h of them is the same. Well. Either they're both in A, or they're both in B, or one is in A and one is in B. If they're both in A, then when you take H of it, that's the same as taking F of those two values. Um, and then you can use the injectivity of F to deduce that the X values are the same. If they're both in B, then you do a similar thing, but with G instead. Uh, if one of them is in A and one of them is in B, and you assume that the H values are the same, well, that can't happen, you see, because the h values would be f of, one of, uh, f of the first x and g of the second x, which would mean that f, um, the image of the first one would be in c, and the image of the second one would be in d. Um, it's impossible for those to agree because c and d have no elements in common by this assumption here. So we really need these assumptions in the proof, and it really shows up. So that case 3 simply can't happen, and, and so that completes the proof of injectivity. For surjectivity, that's a little bit simpler. You give yourself an element y in the codomain, and you have to produce an x in the domain which maps to it. Well, if the x is in the codomain, then either it's in c or in d. If it happens to be in c, then we can use the surjectivity of f to produce something in a that f maps, um, f maps um, to that element. Um, and if it happens to be in D, if the Y happens to be in D, we can use the surjectivity of G to produce an element in B um, that, uh, for which G maps to it. So either way, uh, we can produce an element in the domain which maps to any element of C union D, and that would show that the mapping is surjective.